Today we're going to be taking an in-depth look inside of the Mazda MZR engine, also known as the Ford Duratec, to see what's inside and how it works. Now this one here is a 2 liter version out of a Mazda 3 which came in with a ticking or knocking kind of noise. So we'll tear this down to see what happened and we're also going to examine some of the weaker points on this engine. Now taking a quick look around this engine, this is a double overhead cam engine underneath this plastic valve cover. Now the intake side has variable valve timing. You can see you've got this timing cover here made of metal and this here would be your water pump. At the front here you have a plastic intake manifold which has variable geometry to help with the air intake flow and then we've got port injection up at the top here. And down around the back of the engine you can see you've got a lot of hosing and wiring for the cooling and the vacuum control systems as well as the EGR valve and then we've also got our throttle body. Then down around the back here you can see you've got an aluminum pan, aluminum block as well as an aluminum head and you can see you've got the extra port here for the exhaust side that'll go back into the EGR system. Now there are many variants of the 2 liter engine. The MZR was used in earlier Mazdas and Ford still uses a version of the MZR engine in the form of the Durotec 2 liter today. Now the EcoBoost versions do have turbochargers which are going to be bolted up right at the exhaust here. Now I've just drained the engine oil and there was sufficient oil inside so if I just use my wife's old toothbrush here you can see that the oil is a brownish color and there's nothing really obvious sticking out that this engine had a big problem yet. Now unlike all of the other engines that I've torn down instead of coming with a Fram this engine comes with a mobile one filter. <laughs> Oily situations call for my wife's old sweater here to clean things up. No particles or anything obvious here. Now I'm going to start this tear down by removing the ignition coils. These all look pretty dry. Now we're going to pull spark plugs to see what's inside this engine. Whoa, this is rusty and milky. So if I'm going to guess, cylinder one probably had a compression issue or the head gasket on that side blown. Next I'm going to pull all the valve cover bolts. And now I'm going to lift off that valve cover. Underneath the valve cover things don't look too bad. It is made of plastic though. And here's where you have the rings that go around your ignition coils to stop oil from entering the spark plug area. Now taking a look on this valve cover things don't look too bad. There's a little bit of tarnishing from the oil. But it doesn't look like there's any major oil starvation problems. The timing chain itself is also nice and tight at least in this area here. You can see here we've got the variable valve timing solenoid which actually goes through the valve cover to connect to its connector. And it's going to feed this VVT gear. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove all the bolts that hold this intake to the head. Now taking a look at what's underneath this intake here you can see we've got this bypass hose that leads from the thermostat over here back over to the back of the head here. Now the coolant is going to pass through these hoses over here then through the EGR so it kind of cools off the EGR before it goes through this port here to be fed back into the intake. Of course one of the downsides to having that dirty EGR fed back into the intake is that your intake ports are going to get clogged up. You can see this one's pretty black but as you go down inside you can see that it actually cleans up quite a bit just past where the fuel injectors are and that's the advantage of having port injection because the fuel is going to clean off those intake valves before air gets sucked down into the engine. Now at the front here under this plastic cover is your PCV separator. It's supposed to separate some of the oil coming off of the crankcase from the bottom before it being fed back through the intake through this hose over here. Next we're going to start by working on the timing cover side of the engine. So we've got to get the crank pulley off as well as the water pump and thermostat assembly over here. And this water pump seems like it's seen better days. The pump barely wants to move freely. I'm just going to remove these bolts for the water pump. Then remove that pulley. Remove the crank bolt. And the crank. One thing is there's actually no keyway on the crank, which kind of sucks. So how are you going to time this engine? Move a couple of 13s here for the engine mount. This also means you're going to have to support the engine if you have to do any timing work with this engine in the car. And now I'm going to remove a million 8mm bolts that hold this timing cover on. I'll just remove this water pump here. Alright, there's the water pump. Now I'm going to pry off this timing cover. I don't see any obvious timing chain damage. Now here's one thing that makes it really hard to work on this engine. You can see that this shaft is not keyed to this timing gear. So as I rotate this here, you can see the timing chains don't rotate. Just the crankshaft is rotating. Now what happens is when you put the harmonic balancer in, it's actually going to squish against this little washer here. And that's what's going to time these two together so that you can rotate the crankshaft with this timing gear. Obviously it's going to be a little bit more difficult in order to time this because you have to set the crank and cam positions manually. There's nothing like timing marks or keyed slots that you can put in. Now you can see with the harmonic balancer on there, this is gonna be connected now to the crankshaft and I can rotate the engine. Although, 
it's going to get stuck because they've screwed up the timing and they're probably interfering with the valves now. Now the timing chain set up on the M0 is pretty straightforward. You get your crankshaft at the bottom here and your exhaust and intake cam at the top here driven by a timing chain and a signal tensioner. You've also got a secondary chain that drives the oil pump located off to the side here. And we'll start by removing some of these timing components. Remove the tension. And then I can just pop off this slide here. Now surprisingly the back part of these slides here are actually made of metal while the sliding part here is made of plastic. Most of the time these are just one piece plastic. A couple of 8 mils here for this timing chain guide. Now this one's completely made of plastic. Now this here is the MZR engine timing chain and this one's out of a Volkswagen GTI which arguably does have its own stretch timing chain issues but you can see the difference here with the GTI has got a lot more links on it. Remove the tensioner here for the oil pump chain and then I can get the oil pump chain assembly off just like that and then the timing gear here oh and that's the washer that keeps everything in time Let's see if I can remove these cam bolts and this is the little washer that came off of it again these cam gears are not keyed to the camshaft at all so it's going to be a little tricky in order to time this properly here's the variable valve timing one again this one is also not keyed moving across to the back of the engine here I'm going to remove this accessory mount See the cooling jacket inside of there and I'm going to remove the EGR valve and that's what it looks like this controls the exhaust side flowing back to the intake side over here I'm just going to pry off this fuel rail here okay, maybe I pried off the fuel rail without the injector moving up to the top again I'm going to remove this 8mm bolt with a variable valve timing solenoid here it's just a typical oil control style I got another video on how variable valve timing works, so you get to check the link above if you want to know how. I'm going to remove all the cam caps, they're all 10 millimeter. Now if I remove this camshaft here, just to note the way you're actually supposed to time this is this flat groove over here. It's supposed to line up with the top of the valve cover so that you can put a slot in here and then you know that this camshaft is in the right position. And the same thing goes for the intake camshaft. And then remove the intake camshaft. And instead of having a roller rocker arm system, which is a bit more complicated, the MZR engines are a lot simpler. They're just a bucket style that directly presses down on your valve. So if you take this off here, you can see you've got this little bucket here. And it's going to have a number inside that's shimmed according to it. So you might have to do a valve clearance on these occasionally by adding shims underneath here so you don't get that tapping sound as things wear out. Now things are a little bit oily here, so I'll just use my brother's freshly stolen sock here. To kind of wipe this out so I can see what head bolts these are and it looks like those are Torx. So they're actually a T55 Torx. Uh, even when they're pretty tight. I'm going to wind these bolts free now. I notice that these head bolts have a lot of sludge inside of them. All right now I'll remove the engine head. You know, the gasket itself is a multi-layer steel gasket. It physically looks like it's intact. I don't notice any burn spots or anything. The cylinder one has that mystery gooey stuff that's kind of like watery consistent. Something like coolant and rust mixed together. Two and three look fine. Four has some abnormal shiny spots on the two outsides. So I'm wondering if there was some piston to valve collision. Now cylinder one, the top of the head looks okay. Two and three are fine. Four, you can see evidence here where something has touched the top of the cylinder head. The valves themselves look okay, but it seems like the piston may have contacted it, probably due to a bearing not being in cylinder 4. Next I need to rotate the engine on the stand here and turn it over, and I know that's going to create a mess, so I do have my brother's old shirt here handy to sap up any fluids. Alright, I hate this part. And of course it made a mess. I'm going to just sap all that up here. Alright, with the engine turned upside down, I'm going to first remove this oil filter housing. It's worth noting that this here has the oil pressure sensor on it and it has a spin-on style canister oil filter which is pretty easy to change without any special tools. Now I'm going to pull all these 10 millimeter bolts out so we can take off the pan. Now one thing I don't like is that the timing cover bolts directly to the oil pan going in sideways. So that means you can't really drop this oil pan out. You got to take the whole timing cover off in order to drop this if you got to do any work here. Just pry that out. Now taking a look inside the oil pan, there is some grey sludge at the bottom here and I do notice that there's some particles inside here. Now taking a look at the crankcase, you can see things are actually pretty clean. There's not too much of that sludge build up anywhere. And if you take a look at the connecting rods, you'll notice that cylinder number 4 is actually burnt out. It's got this blackish color. You can see compared to cylinder number 1, it's nice and gold. And if I move this around, there is some free play. So we definitely know something's wrong with cylinder number four. Over here we've also got this plastic oil pickup tube that's gonna draw oil down into the oil pump which is driven off of that timing chain at the front of the engine. 
Ah, there is a screen inside of here and I can see that there are a few particles in there. I'm just going to pull off this oil pump. And you can see it's a fairly smallish compact style unit. These bolts going through it and you've got your oil passage for pickup here. And it's going to push it back into the block over here. Which is then going to be fed on that side to your oil filter. So the connecting rod bolts are on external Torx E12. Let's see the carnage. Okay, there's no bearing on this side. So you can see what happened here. The connecting rod cap itself is pretty black and burnt up as well as the crankshaft in this region here. So what happened was the oil was starved causing this bearing here to heat up and the bearing can't stand it anymore and it just seizes up and it actually rotates when this connecting rod moves up and down. So you can see the edge of it right here and it's done some damage to this crank. I can actually feel it here through my wife's toothbrush. You also notice just how thin these bearings are. They did have to wear down quite a bit before they actually gave up and rotated. And of course because there's no bearing on this top surface in between this cap here there's now a gap and that's what's going to cause this engine to play knock knock jokes with you when it's running just use my wife's toothbrush to push the piston down wow here's what that piston looks like you can see the end of this connecting rod is really black and all burnt up and the bearing surfaces are all scored up as well i'll just continue taking apart the rest of these connecting rods now piston number one also had quite a bit of overheating and scoring done to it but it's not nearly as black as piston number four. You can also see the bearing itself is really chewed up on the inside here and very rough. And this side here is kind of burnt out, so maybe this one was gonna spin next. And here's a look at piston number one and its upper bearing. You can see this bearing is all chewed up at the bottom here and very, very rough. Piston number three is not nearly as bad. The bearing is a little bit more smooth. And here's bearing number two. This one, again, is not nearly as bad. It is kind of burnt up though. Yeah, I think piston number two probably fared the best. Now I need to remove this metal girdle inside of here, which is what's supporting the main bearings for this crankshaft. So just remove these 15 millimeter bolts. All right, with all those bolts knocked out, should be able to pry this girdle off. Here we go. And we'll just pop that off. You can see the bearing surfaces don't look so bad. So whatever oil starvation this had, it didn't make it down to the main bearings. And now I can remove the crankshaft. Now I'm going to pull this off the engine stand. So here I've got all the major engine components laid out here. So we're going to have a closer look at each one. And we'll start here at the engine's oil pan. You can see if I lift off this baffle over here. You can have a look at all the crap inside of this oil pan here. I do like that it's a one piece design. There's no upper and lower oil pan. And it is made of aluminum though. But you can definitely tell there's a lot of medical particles inside of here. And next we'll take a look at this aluminum block. Now the oil pump sits on this little cavity on the side here. And it's responsible for drawing up oil through that oil pickup tube up inside of this little oil galley inside of here to travel across the engine. The oil is then going to come through this galley over here out to this side here where you see we've got these two ports that are connected to the two ports over here on the oil filter housing to filter out the oil. The filter oil is then going to go back through this hole inside of here and follow this galley over here down this way and then across to this main galley that runs along the block here to lubricate the crankshaft and its bearings. But teeing off that main oil galley is the oil feed hole for the heads to lubricate all the camshaft and their bearings. Now over here on the front of the engine where the timing chain is, you can see this is where the main oil galley is and they've also teed off of it to feed oil to the hydraulic chain tensioner over here. And then it also tees off over here to feed this small little port on the engine's head here which is going to feed the variable valve timing system. So it's actually got a separate oil circuit for the VVT system compared to this hole over here for just a general lubrication of the head. Now another feature on this block here is the oil separator. You can see that crankcase ventilation is going to come up here and it's got this plastic baffle here that bolts up to it which is going to hopefully prevent any oil from being drawn back into the intake through this little port over here and drop the oil back down to the sump. Now taking a look at the crankshaft, the main bearings itself actually look pretty good as well as the girdle that it sat on. And I was finally able to pry those spun bearings off and you can see it's actually got this profile where it's been squished and squeezed out to create this ridge on the edge here on both of them. And they are pretty thin compared to the other bearings. Now the oil supply in this engine actually starts from the back and makes its way to the front. So I find it kind of interesting that both cylinder one and four are starved. You probably think that maybe the first few cylinders would be okay and the ones furthest away would be starved. 
carved, but it's probably something internal inside of the crankshaft that may have clogged up because the mains are fine and the rod bearings are gone. Or it could just be simple oil starvation and then these were the first two to start giving out. And then they probably loaded it up with a whole tank of oil which is what I got it with. Now taking a look at the engine head itself you can see that through these dowel pins here is where the oil is going to feed up inside of the engine head and over here for the variable valve timing system. Now the variable valve timing feed is going to come up through the bottom over here and then go up this way, across this way and then out to this port on the top of the head right here. Now this variable valve timing piece is going to sit over here on top of this head and is going to take some of that oil through this oil control valve over here and control the amount that goes through this channel over here to feed the variable valve timing gear. And over here on the exhaust side of the engine you can see some of the exhaust coming off of cylinder number four here is going to be snaked around back through this port over here and pushed in through the head this way. Now the exhaust gases are then going to travel through this water jacket over here where it's going to get cooled down then past the EGR valve itself here which controls the amount of exhaust gases that get recirculated back through the intake. Now looking on the intake side of the engine here you can see that we've got our port injectors that are going to definitely help to clean off the back of the intake valves here so you actually don't have carbon buildup issues with these intake valves. Now the camshaft bearings didn't really suffer so much from oil starvation. Some of them do have a couple of lines though but I definitely can't feel them with my finger. Now taking a look at the air intake on this engine you can see it is made of plastic and it's got these baffles inside of here that's all controlled by this vacuum or manifold over here. Now I do have another video on how these flaps work in order to change the air input characteristics. Now some of these Mazdas and Ford suffered from an issue where these flaps would actually break off and end up in the intake. We've got this manifold absolute pressure sensor on the bottom here as well as your built-on throttle body with its coolant connection. And that's an in-depth look inside of the Mazda MZR and Ford Duratec 2 liter engines. Now these engines while mechanically simple they do have their fair share of issues so you, if you do have one of these you definitely want to make sure you take good care of it and feed it proper oil otherwise you're going to end up with a burnt piston and a spun bearing just like this one. Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next engine teardown is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one.